Today we have the honor to interview Dr. Peter Macola. Our interview will be published in Portuguese by the Periódico Che Química, in English by the Southern Journal of Sciences, and we will share this interview with a local television station, Conecta Mais TV. The contents of, the content of this interview will be shared under a Creative Commons license. Dr. Macola, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. And I would like to start our interview asking you about your medical career. Why did you choose to be a cardiologist? And how, how did you get where you are today? Growing up, I always uh, loved the idea of using science to help people. Uh, and medicine is the most common, best combination of the application of the, certainly the biological sciences and helping people through difficult times, through uh, and diseases and prevention of hospitalization and death. I uh, grew up in Texas. I'm traveling across Texas right now by bus. So you can see it in the background. I um, attended Baylor University, undergraduate, then the University of Texas Southwestern. I did my residency in internal medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. I did uh, three years of rural health medicine, and then the third year of public health and trained in epidemiology. I went on to complete my cardiology fellowship at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine and served in academic leadership positions uh, all over the country uh, in cardiology. I've, I've kept my board certifications in both medicine and cardiology, and I'm broadly published on many topics. Thank you very much, Dr. McCauley. Uh, to avoid any delays, I will move to our next question. Regarding your career as a medical journal, how does your experience as an editor of a pres prestigious medical journals influence your approach to evaluate research and scientific evidence? The peer review process is critical for the advancement of the clinical science and, and certainly medical progress. And uh, we rely on the peer review process. I've been a reviewer of manuscripts now uh, over three decades. I am editor in chief of uh, two widely read journals, Reviews in Cardiovascular Medicine and Cardio Renal Medicine. Those are former positions. I'm still a very active reviewer today of uh, many manuscripts. Uh, that means I've actually seen and examined more evidence, more data, interpreted uh, the information. And, and, you know, under my watch as an editor, I've never retracted a paper. Never. Review process, and we rely on this. Uh, I may not agree with every paper that's published, but you know, my agreement is not what matters. What matters is uh, the, uh, you know, the formal scientific vetting of peer review. Now, as an author, I have uh, nearly 700 citations now listings in the National Library of Medicine PubMed. I have over a thousand overall published medical communications, and I continue to be very active in academic medicine. Very good. Thank you. What are some of the biggest challenges you face in ensuring the integrity and the quality of the published research in the field of medicine. One of the biggest threats to validity is what's considered investigator bias. That is the bias of the uh, authors of the manuscripts being published. And they can be biased by their funding sources, whether they're federal sources, private or, or pharmaceutical industry sources. They can be biased according to their own treatments they've taken as individuals. And we saw this really come forward now in the, in the COVID-19 vaccine crisis, which we'll cover later. Uh, but investigator bias, that is the bias of the authors of the paper, very, very important to vet this. That's the reason why we ask for disclosures uh, to interpret conflict of interest. Uh, and of course, there are many other threats to validity, uh, including, um, uh, bias at the level of uh, the reviewers, the editors, the publishers, 
uh, and hopefully the peer review process handles that. We have um, uh, uh, various forms of study bias, confounding uh, issues with internal, external uh, validity, biological plausibility, and all of that we use in this peer review process to help the scientific community and the public and the, and the public at large get to this scientific truth. Thank you very much, Doctor. My last question regarding the editor. How do you balance the need of scientific rigor with the importance of disseminating potentially groundbreaking findings in a timely manner? The peer review process is slow and laborious. And um, one of the things that came out during the pandemic, which I think is a positive development, is the use of preprint servers, that is the publication of data to widely disseminate it before peer review. And the preprint servers do fairly tell the reader that uh, the information has not been peer reviewed. We tend to uh, not read too much into the author's conclusions, but simply want to see the data in tables and figures. Uh, that allows nearly immediate uh, dissemination of information. Many now, uh, well-read journals have a preprint option that allows the information to come out in preprint. Uh, many journals have uh, late-breaking clinical trials or expedited review processes. All of them are important to get information out quickly. But I do want people to understand that many times the peer review process for a, a fully vetted manuscript could take a, you know even up to two years. Perfect. I love this opinion. Thank you very much. If you allow me, I would like to ask you about uh, your expertise in Pheidippides cardiomyopathy. Could you explain this phenomenon uh, and, and its connection to your research interests? Uh, personally, I was a marathon runner for many years, so I became interested in this issue of uh, sudden cardiac death among marathoners. Now, Pheidippides was the Greek peril that ran a tremendous distance between two cities during one of the uh, wars that influenced Greece. Now, it turns out he ran way more than a marathon. Uh, marathon's 26.2 uh, miles. Uh, he ran probably about 72 miles uh, and then died of exhaustion. He actually uh, fell to his death, and that's Pheidippides. Uh, but we have noted um, elite marathoners having a, a cardiac arrest, and, and there's been detailed studies of uh, cardiac MRI and biomarkers, and um, we've published many papers on this. And so, suffice it to say, there may be a genetic predisposition. A marathon is an extreme stress on the body. There are elevations of inflammatory factors, other markers of cardiac stress. And uh, in fact, the part of the heart that's probably impacted is the right ventricle. It's probably chronic volume overload over the course of about two to four hours. Then in some individuals, that right ventricular stretch can precipitate a ventricular tachycardia that degenerates to a ventricular fibrillation. So I've been interested in training techniques of walking, running, uh, other measures to, to help people avoid this complication because uh, it's not congenital heart disease and it's not occult coronary disease, it actually is a marathon-induced form of a right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's possible to prevent it or treat it, or it happens when it happens? No, I think it's possible to prevent it probably with different training techniques. And um, uh, we want to understand the predisposing factors. And I think the bottom line is running marathons may not be safe for everyone. So I want people to understand that, uh, you know, marathon running, which is quite popular now, is not universally safe. Perfect. Regarding uh, a new subject, okay? Uh, myocarditis and pericarditis. My first question, I am not a, a doctor, okay? I am former professor of chemistry. Could you describe the key differences between myocarditis and pericarditis as well as their potential causes and risk factors. Let's take pericarditis first, since it's more common. Pericarditis is inflammation of the lining around the heart. The pericardium has two layers, a layer on the external surface of the heart 
and then a layer that which is a um, a sac in the center part of the chest called the mediastinum. And in, in there is fluid. The pericardium can become inflamed uh, and this can be uh, due to various viruses such as the Coxsackie virus, adenovirus, occasionally influenza virus. Uh, it's, uh, it's also idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes this. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, characterized by pain on taking a deep breath and laying flat. Uh, we can uh, see obvious EKG changes, see fluid around the heart on ultrasound. And then it's treated uh, with a, a principal medication called colchicine, which is now standard of care. Colchicine is a unique anti-inflammatory which impairs microtubule formation in the granulocytes, which are inflammatory cells that are right there in the pericardial space and in the pericardial tissue. Uh, idiopathic or post-viral per pericarditis uh, can set up a patient for recurrent pain and sometimes adhesive constrictive pericarditis. So treatment is important and treatment should uh, be undertaken probably for about a year. This has now been well worked out in clinical trials. Myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle itself. Uh, myocarditis prior to the pandemic uh, could be caused by uh, parvovirus, other viral infections, again, idiopathic. Uh, there's a particular form of a fatal myocarditis called giant cell myocarditis that uh, uh, doctors specifically take a cardiac biopsy to try to diagnose because those patients almost certainly need a uh, heart transplant. Uh, and, and then our approach to myocarditis, again, is uh, relies on the use of colchicine, in some cases, uh, corticosteroids, plasma exchange, IVIG, and, and then even in advanced cases, we may use various forms of immunosuppressives like rapamycin. We hope that in myocarditis, we avoid two major outcomes, and that is the development of heart failure or cardiac arrest, sudden death. Uh, and so patients are carefully monitored. I can tell you in these conditions, many times the pericarditis and the myocarditis occur together. And so we call it myopericarditis. And again, before COVID, it was in all of the cardiology guidance, guidelines, physician papers, review papers, that we cannot allow patients to exercise because the surge of adrenaline with exercise in a patient with myopericarditis will precipitate cardiac arrest. Regarding the myocarditis, uh, recently I saw the term, I believe that it's light myocarditis. Is it possible? No, I don't think that's an appropriate term. We have to take each case very seriously. If you have myocarditis, you have the risk to die, correct? That's true. And we've learned this now uh, with the pandemic. COVID-19 respiratory illness in 2020 uh, did not cause any serious cases of myocarditis. There was a handful of cases described uh, in a paper by Daniels and colleagues from the uh, college athletic leagues. and uh, in community cases of uh, COVID respiratory illness. I've seen one bona fide case in my practice, uh, and, and this was a, uh, a case that required medical attention, including hospitalization and treatment. But with COVID-19 illness, it's not common. Uh, when patients are admitted with COVID-19 in the hospital, an elevation in cardiac troponin does not indicate myocarditis. That's not adjudicated myocarditis. And it's that observation that's led to a false narrative that myocarditis is common with to infection. Uh, what we know now is the COVID-19 vaccines cause frequently myopericarditis. It's in all the regulatory warnings from the FDA. And indeed, COVID-19 vaccine myocarditis can present with cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. Oh. Doctor, uh, I'm sorry I will rush our interview. I will move to the next topic, okay? Uh, regarding the Nuremberg Code and the Helsinki Declaration, 
again, uh, I am not a doctor. This is not uh, familiar to myself. Could you explain the significance of the Nuremberg Code and Helsinki Declaration in the context of medical ethics and research involving human subjects? And I also would like to know if they are still valid today. There are cornerstones of medical ethics as they apply to research and the use of novel uh, treatments or uh, medications. And uh, one of the bedrocks is actually the Declaration of Helsinki, which states that, that each person uh, deserves full, free, informed consent, that they fully understand the risks and the potential benefits of either participating in research or not taking a novel product or not taking a novel product. And then the Nuremberg Code, which came out of the Nuremberg trials after uh, the fall of Nazi Germany, where, uh, where individuals in Germany were uh, forced into um, unsafe and unethical research done by Nazi doctors. In the Nuremberg Code, the first uh, item is uh, an important statement. And it says that no one under any circumstances can receive any pressure, coercion, or threat of reprisal for not participating or participating in research or taking a novel uh, experimental product under any circumstances. There must be free choice and there should be no threat to that individual whatsoever. So the practice of coercion people to participate in medical trials should be avoided. It should be prohibited. Yes, prohibited. Much better term. Thank you. I, I am having a great class today with you, doctor. Thank you. Uh, if you allow me to go a little bit deeper. Thank you. I would like to ask another question. I saw a research commenting on an image that I believe I saw in a website of yourself. Okay. It's regarding the use of bromelin, natokinase, and curcumin. Could you talk a little bit about it? How it can improve uh, conditions? McCullough protocol based spike protein detoxification, which is now uh, copyrighted and trademarked in Europe and application pending in the United States is a breakthrough. Two pins in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons and in the Springer Nature Journal, Curious Journal of Biomedical Sciences, have um, made this proposal that based on preclinical and clinical data, that uh, the enzyme natokinase, which is derived from the fermentation of soy, bromelain, which is a family of enzymes derived from the stems of pineapple, and then curcumin, which is uh, an anti-inflammatory derived from turmeric, all available in supplement capsule form, work together to help uh, degrade the spike protein, uh, which is the injurious um, part of the viral infection, the spine on the surface of the virus. It's also uh, the dangerous protein product that is in COVID-19 vaccines or it's produced from the genetic vaccines in an uncontrolled fashion in the body and accumulates in the body. That natokinase, 2,000 units twice a day, bromelain, 500 milligrams a day, and curcumin, 500 milligrams twice a day as a starting program is a reasonable detoxification approach for a minimum of three oftentimes out to 12 months to help reduce the burden of spike protein in the body and hopefully lessen uh, symptoms and reduce the risk of serious complications. Another short question. People talk about the uh, clots being formed and the this blood test, uh, D-dimer, I believe it is. How do they relate and can these clots be dissolved in the body or never again? D-dimer has, has turned out to be an indicator of micro and macro thrombosis uh, that's precipitated by the spike protein, both in the natural infection and in patients who have taken the vaccine. So I routinely measure D-dimer 
in both post-infection and post-vaccine patients. When it's elevated, uh, the interpretation is it indicates microthrombosis. It's a call at the bare minimum for the use of aspirin. I think it's a wonderful uh, call for the use of natokinase and bromelain. And then in some patients who actually have detectable thrombosis by ultrasound or imaging, we add uh, more serious blood thinners, including the novel uh, anticoagulants or warfarin. Thank you very much, doctor. We are approaching the final round of questions, and I would like to, to ask you about uh, censorship in the United States and abroad. From your perspective, how has the is issue of censorship impact the ability of medical professionals and researchers to freely discuss and disseminate information related to public health matters, both in the United States and internationally? Intentional censorship by governments all over the world through um, complicit media outlets, including social media, in bringing the public the truth on multi-drug early therapy for COVID-19 and on vaccine safety has cost large numbers of lives. Effectively, censorship has killed people worldwide. The public deserves the opportunity to always learn about new advancements on how to prevent COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths and how to treat and manage and avoid vaccine injuries, disabilities, and deaths. And the censorship has been directed against any hope of people getting treatment or avoiding complications. The censorship has actively promoted continued endless mass vaccination. And now it's on trial in the US Supreme Court in the case of Missouri versus Biden. The Supreme Court heard that case in the last week and I can tell you, it will take probably a month or two to, to deliberate and get the answer. But the, it is known the U.S. government is inside social media and mainstream media. And the Supreme Court will decide to either allow the government and its agents to remain with this influence or to get the government out of media so scientists and doctors can have free discourse without censorship. I think it's a critical case and we'll keep you updated on the results. Just for the record, okay, today is March 22, 2024, so we can have a, a post-follow yeah. for the future. Uh, in this, in the, regarding the censorship issue, I imagine that uh, extremely qualified professionals such as your, yourself, you would never be censored. Have you experienced something like that? I, you know, for decades, I studied the interface between heart and kidney disease. I published as I am now, gave lectures, um, you know, was on a whole variety of media outlets. I've testified for the Congressional Oversight Panel before the pandemic. I have never seen censorship in my career until the COVID-19 pandemic arose. And the pandemic has brought out unprecedented actions taken against scientists such as myself, I'm deeply concerned that all of the actions that have occurred with respect to censorship and reprisal worked to hurt innocent civilians, to hurt the public all over the world, has created fear, suffering, hospitalization, and death. And we must all join together to put an end to this censorship and allow people like myself and people in my circles to bring you the truth. Doctor, it has been a pleasure to speak to you. I know that you are an extremely busy man. In the name of uh, the journals that I am representing, I would like to say thank you very much. It was a great opportunity. We hope to have the opportunity to speak with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.